What's the word, y'all? I, I am still sick right now, which is unfortunate because I can't get as animated or get as loud or get as passionate as I want to get. Um, I'm co recording an early recap, ladies and gentlemen, and you know why. The Suns are currently down 40, 41 in a game seven. This is a team that won 64 games, head and shoulders above every other team in the regular season. My favorite to win the NBA Finals, they're going against Luka, Spencer Dinwiddie, and they're down by 41 in the third quarter. Halftime, they had 27 points. I have, I listen, I know we always live in the moment, so I'm going to say this without even really thinking about it. I ain't never seen this hard of a collapse, and, and I haven't seen it in a long time at least, with these type of stakes. You are the one seed, and, and for the entire regular season, you've looked like the best team in basketball. It doesn't matter if y'all missed missing Devin Booker for some games, DeAndre Aiden for some games, Chris Paul for some games. Y'all were head and shoulders above every other team in basketball. And before this series started, if you go look at the ESPN prediction, every single writer at ESPN picked the Suns. Every single person on my podcast picked the Suns. Everybody thought the Suns, not that we they was going to wax the floor because the Mavericks are a good team and they got one of the greatest in basketball right now. But I was pretty confident thinking that the Suns were going to take care of business in this series. And I definitely thought that they were going to take care of business in Game 7, considering every single game this series has been home team, home team, home team with the wins. And for them to go out there on their home court and get spanked like this is crazy. Um, I, and, and as of right now, Devin Booker literally scored his first field goal of the game with five minutes left in the third quarter. Hold on. Chris, Chris Paul, too. Listen, y'all know me as one of the biggest Chris Paul fans on the platform. Um, he is my favorite player of all time. Um, and, and but I am I'm not a stand by any means. I can admit when bro has been terrible. And this is this now is the fourth game of this series where he played like absolute trash. He is one for five from the field. He's got two fouls. He ain't got no turnovers. He's got two fouls. He's a minus 37 right now. And one thing I saw early in this game is is he was like grabbing at his quad. I, I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. This is an embarrassing, embarrassing outcome for them. You know, there's no, I don't know the word I want to use. There's no shame in losing a game seven, especially to a team that showed us throughout the series they're really damn good. Like the the Milwaukee Bucks just lost their game seven too. Nobody in that organization should hang their head low. This is a different level. This is an absolutely different level. Devin Booker's all NBA first team this year, I'm assuming. Chris Paul is NBA third team, I would assume. DeAndre Aiden wants a max contract, and Broaz can't score on anybody at the moment. Mikael Bridges was number three, and or number two and number three in defensive player of the year. And somehow, Jay Crowder is like taking majority of the shots, it feels like. You're going against a team that's Luka Doncic and a bunch of role players. Now, I'm not trying to devalue them, but like they don't have anybody on this team that was even in conversation to even touch an all-star game, even in conversation to be an all-defensive player. You lost this series to that. No, no, no. You're losing by 40 to that. Insanity, bro. And I don't know what the hell happens from this point on. My tattoo artist, oh, Grant Williams just liked my tweet. <laughs> Shout out to my homie Grant. I tweeted a video of two weeks ago. Um, my boy Pierre was saying that somebody was going to have a legendary like performance in this one. And I said two weeks ago, Grant Williams. And my boy Grant liked the video because, I mean, bro, we're going to talk about that for sure, for sure. Um, and my tattoo artist said, this game is like WTF. Randy Orton RKO out of nowhere. Shout out, to, shout out to David Tattoos, bro, here in Chicago. He's one of the greatest to ever do it. He's done like 90% of my work. You know when I knew this game was like over? This is crazy to say because the game of basketball, when you get to the first quarter, nothing matters. You could be down by 20 points in the fourth, first quarter, and you still got three quarters to, to claw your way out, and you can still win that game. Um, early on, the one of the first possessions of the game, Jay Crowder got the ball, and Chris Paul was wide open on the wing, but Jay Crowder did like a step back three, and he bricked it. And then we go into halftime. You know, Monty Williams had to get him some type of pep talk. Come on, man. I know we down by 30, but anything is possible in the game of basketball. I, that's what I would assume he's saying. And the first possession out of, out of halftime is a leaning three from Jay Crowder in the corner. How did we get here? They were just interviewing Jason Kidd, and Jason Kidd said in it that, like, er, um, early in the series, they weren't making Chris Paul defend. They were letting Chris Paul guard the corners – and in the last couple games, some of the games that they've won, they've made it a priority to make Chris Paul work on both sides of the floor. And that's something that we've talked about on this uh, in the last couple of recaps, how they were hunting Chris Paul. They were hunting Devin Booker. I mean, you might be one of the greatest of all time, but you're still 37 years old 
And though you're a positive defender, I would say, you're still seven inches shorter than Luka Doncic. You're still not as fast as Jalen Brunson. So, yeah, we're going to make you work. And we're going we gonna to trap Devin Booker when he gets the ball. And we're going to prevent Chris Paul from doing anything on a pick and roll. Jason Kidd outcoached Monty Williams to uh, to the third degree. And, boy, I, oh, I swear I wish I wasn't sick, bro, because I, oh, I, I'm, I'm so much more passionate about this game than you, you even imagine. Because y'all know, like I said, Chris Paul is my favorite of all time, and I've wanted to see him win a championship for as long as I can remember. Since, uh, since they vetoed the Chris Paul to the Lakers trade, I'd be like, oh, he got to get his own. And he's had a lot of opportunities to do that. He's been in the conference finals a couple times at this point. Um, and it always feels like something wrong happens. He goes down with a quad injury or somebody else on his team gets injured. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of different factors. But this one, I don't I don't think there's anything. And there's no excuse other than him and his team playing like trash. They not missing any players. They were the better team. You know, sometimes like, like I think about like LeBron's overall record in the finals. And other than the one in 2011 versus the Dallas Mavericks, he went the the losses that he has are against superior teams. Come on, bro. He wasn't about to be KD, Steph Curry, you know what I'm saying, and all of those dudes. Um, but he has the one in 2011 where his team was the favorite and they lost. But like, uh, uh, I, I'm sometimes Chris Paul has lost playoff series to the superior team. This is one of the times where he is the superior team. He's on the superior team, and they choked it all away. What does this mean for Chris Paul's legacy? Nothing. He's still one of the greatest point guards of all time, and that'll never change. But it just hurts his chances of getting a championship because next year, I would assume, not saying he's going to fall off, but the the age thing is going to come to him eventually. He's not going to be 41 making all NBA teams. You know what I'm saying? This was his best opportunity probably in the entirety of his career other than the Houston year where he, he hurt his quad. A-Rod is sitting course ass sleep. They just show A-Rod on the camera. He was dead ass sleep. That's how this game is going. The crowd is out of it completely. And now Kobe is trying to open the door. Um, but other than the Houston Rockets where he tore his quad, this was his best opportunity to win a championship. They had a, a, what felt like a complete team. Um, they had Devin Booker, who's a, a superstar uh, scorer. DeAndre Aiden, great defender. Uh, Mikael Bridges, great defender. And in the regular season, they had a really good bench. Majority of those things failed them tonight. All of those things, not majority, all of those things failed them tonight. Chris Paul failed uh, the team. Devin Booker failed the team. DeAndre Aiden failed the team. Mikael Bridges, the homie, felt that like they, this is this is not good. This is not good. But now, now that we spent all the time talking about them, let me kick Koba out and let's talk about the Dallas Mavericks. I, ex I highly, and I mean highly underestimated this team. And I don't know if that's because I was super high on the Suns or, or what. And, and then, you know what, you know what it might have been? I, I'm just so used to teams that have like one superstar player and like a bunch of role players. I feel like I'm so used to those teams like, not being able to go this far. Um, like like I said, Luka doesn't have anybody on the team that was in, in conversations for all-star appearance. He doesn't have anybody that was an all-defensive player. He, he doesn't even have anybody that's a max player on his team right now. But he has 35 points right now with a whole quarter to go. I would assume that they about to start resting these boys. Like, why even have Luka out there? You know what I'm saying? If the Suns go on a 20-0 run, then you bring Luka back. But come on, you got you to rest up. That next series, the conference final series, start very soon. And we're going to probably do a, um, a preview of the conference finals um, in a couple days before it starts, obviously. But I just, hmm. I, I, it's not that I didn't believe in Luka because there's only one person in the world that I would take over Luka if I were starting an organization, and that's Giannis. Uh, but I, I didn't believe in the others. So on March 28th, I, I dropped the video where I was ranking the NBA contenders and pretenders. And, and let me show you how that went. So this is my final thing. I had my favorites as the Bucks and the Suns. Both of them got waxed today. Well, yeah, I got, yes, I can say that actually. Both of them got waxed today. I had Boston as a contender. I had Miami as a contender. Pretty, pretty dope. Um, At this point, James Harden had a couple games where he was looking pretty solid, and I was like, they could be contenders. And you know what? If Joel and B was completely healthy for that series, I still believe that they had a real legitimate chance. They were what two and two and two when he played, or two and three when he played, or something like that. Um, but then there was this next year that has to be perfect, and that's why I had the Dallas Mavericks. I thought everything had to fit perfectly. Everything had to go perfectly for them to be a contender. I mean, the other things on this list seem pretty good, right? The Jazz had to be perfect, and it wasn't. The Memphis Grizzlies had to be perfect, and it wasn't. I mean, they got jaw injured, and that was all they really wrote. And then the Brooklyn Nets, this was the controversial thing at the time. People were like, Kenny, the Brooklyn Nets are contenders. I ain't see it as that. So when I was saying has to be perfect, I was thinking it like, man, 
Somebody had to go down with an injury in their series. Luka had to average 45. You know what I'm saying? Somebody had to average 30 with them. That's what my idea was to has to be perfect. And I was completely wrong there. Everything did not go perfectly for this team for them to be in this position, which is crazy. Luka was dominant, of course. The bro averages 39 points per game in closeout games or game sevens or whatever the hell the stat is. He's doing his thing. But, like, when you look at the rest of the roster, at least tonight, nobody other than, I guess, hey, Spencer did already have an out-of-body experience when you look at the, uh, his other games in the series. I guess last game he wasn't too bad. But you look at his other games in the series, uh, him av- having 28 right now on 69% shooting um, is an out-of-body experience. But, like, everything else is pretty, pretty typical for the team. Jay Brunson is not even having a big game. Dorn Finney-Smith and Reggie Bullock only combined for two threes. Luka is hooping his ass off. Spencer Dinwiddie is hooping his ass off. But bigger than all of that, the defense is preventing anything from getting to the basket. They're preventing these all-star players from getting shots up. F- to getting shots up. Devin Booker has 13 shots, and I promise you, 10 of those is like forced because I have to do I have to do something. Chris Paul has five total shots. DeAndre Aiden, this dude, like I said, wants a max contract. He has five total shots, and he had three fouls in the first quarter or first half or whatever. And I, I'm, I'm so excited about this next round series because well, I guess we're talking about this when my preview drops. Um, we were talking about game six between the Warriors versus the Grizzlies. I was saying, like, what happens when you go against a team that doesn't necessarily allow a ton of offensive rebounds? And well, that's Dallas. Dallas was sixth in the regular season in allowing offensive rebounds, but it was like by 0.1 rebound per game. They do very well in defensive glass. Every single game of the series, whether they were losing or winning, they won the rebound battle. And today is no different. 42 rebounds to what? 34. So the Kavan Looney 11 offensive rebounds plus Wiggins six offensive rebounds that we got yesterday from the Warriors is probably not likely in the next series. And I think that can that can matter. You know, earlier in the series, he quoted um, MJ from The Last Dance. If, you know, people talk the most trash when they up. I want to see you do it when it's 0-0 or whatever. He said that after they lost the game. And he since the very early, from the very first bucket of the game, Luke has been smiling and talking his trash. And I, I like this. I know, oh my gosh, the start of the fourth quarter and tons of fans are just leaving. At least in the third quarter, they put up 23 points, but they gave up 35, which is uncharacteristic for them to give up 95 points in three quarters. I didn't even know where I was going, bro. I'm, I'm just so surprised that this was the outcome of this game. Um, a lot of credit to Jason Kidd as a fir- first-year coach here. Um because if you remember my videos from earlier in the year, I have a video that says the Mavericks are a bad, good team. That was six months ago, by the way. A lot of things changed. And the same thing with the Celtics, right? A lot of things have changed with the Celtics. I had a video on this channel where I was talking about the uh, the toxicity of their subreddit after a big loss. A lot of things can change in one singular season. And these are two super, super great success stories. Shout out to the Mavericks. We're going to talk more about them um, once we get to our, our next series preview. But let's go ahead and talk about the first game of the day. Honestly, it felt like it happened so long ago. The most predictable thing in the world is NBA Twitter or NBA discourse. Um, because I knew exactly what the hell was happening in this game. I knew exactly what was going to happen on Twitter, on Instagram, on the talking head shows and, and tomorrow morning. I knew exactly what's going to happen. First quarter, Giannis was absolutely dominant. He had 10 points, 6 assists. Eight rebounds, no turnovers, no nothing. He was created for the, he even hit a three. Um, he's created for the people. And in the first half, Brooke Lopez was looking more like the normal Brooke Lopez that we haven't got the entire series, basically. Brooke Lopez had been a dude that basically got played off the floor through the first six games. And tonight, they got a, the, probably the best version of him they got for the entire series. And when you add that with Giannis's first quarter, I was like, oh, this is, this is a little bit dangerous for the Boston Celtics. But then things changed. And Coach Bud had a game plan. Um, which is basically the game plan that's been the case for the entire series. It was like, or not the entire series, but the entirety of Coach Bud as a coach. Pack the paint, let them shoot, they'll miss him eventually. But more specifically, they was like, we gonna let Grant Williams beat us. And he did. And I'm thinking to myself, he shot 40% from three this season. You know? Like, that's one of the people you don't want to let shoot. And the thing is, it never changed either. You know, once the player hit a couple open threes, you'd be like, okay, let's send him a body. We did, they did a good job preventing, well, I guess doing the same thing with um, Derek White. They let Derek White shoot whatever he wants because he's a bad three-point shooter. They let Marcus Smart do whatever he wants because he's a 33% three-point shooter. But, like, that, that is one of the few people on the team that you do not want to leave open. And they did it countless, countless times. And I love that I'm guessing Ime Yudoka gave him the green light to continue to shoot it. Because, you know what, so, some players end up getting playing off, played off like this. And it's kind of the Draymond Green thing, but obviously, like I said, Grant Williams is a way better shooter than Draymond Green. But, like, 
when you're that open early in the shot clock, you know that that shot will be there in 12 seconds. So let me see if we can run something else for Jason Tatum. Let me see if we can run something else from Jalen Brown. Not in this game. It didn't matter if it was three seconds into the shot clock. If Grant Williams was open, he was letting it fly. And I love that. Again, a 40% three-point shooter, and they were leaving him open like in the corners, which is like his sweet spot. This is P.J. Tucker 2.0, ladies and gentlemen. And, and like I said, there's a video where um, where I'm, I'm talking about who's going to be the X Factor, who's going to have the greatest performances. And I saying Grant Williams because I thought he he had the most on his plate. He had to be able to knock down his shots, and he had the, one of the main assignments to stop Giannis. And no, there's no stopping Giannis, but he did one hell of a job preventing Giannis from getting anything going. I guess that was a team thing because Al Horford always always does it as well. But they did an amazing job neutralizing Giannis in this game seven. But back to it. I completely know how all everything unfolds. For example, since since the Suns are losing by a million points right now, the next day on Twitter is going to be about Chris Paul's legacy. You know, I can, that's just the way it's going to go. And I knew that, that the time that Giannis has a bad performance – and it's bad by Giannis' standards because he still ended up with 25 and 20 and 9 assists. Uh, a bad performance because we get to that second half. I mean, he was 4 for 14. He had 8 points, 8 rebounds. Like, that's a bad performance from the best player in the world, in my opinion. Um, and I knew what the what the conversation was going to be like. It's, it's so predictable. Yeah, like, we go into these cycles. Player X has a bad performance in a big game. And then automatically, he's not that guy. Automatically, he's not on the same tier of this player, this player, this player. They did the same thing with Giannis two years ago when they got eliminated. And what do you do after that? He came out. He won a championship. He dropped 50 in a closeout game. And that should have been the end of all that. People are forgetting that just last year, he had 50 in a finals closeout game. To say he not he not ready for big moments is like, you started watching basketball this season, didn't you? You had to. You had to. Or you just living so much in the moment that you forgot that this man had one of the greatest closeout finals performances of all time. But today, stinky performance from Giannis. He was missing layups. He was missing bunnies. Shots that we've seen him make a million times in his career. He was missing those. And he, I think he got it to his own head. He was frustrated on the court. Um, he was he was a lot of charges. I think it was 20 plus charges were drawn on him throughout the playoffs. And I mentioned that in our season preview or uh, matchup preview because the Bulls drew a bunch of charges against him. And I was like, hey, the Celtics do a lot better job in putting their body on the line to uh, prevent somebody from doing what they want to do. And they did that in this game. And I could not give Ime Udoka and the Boston Celtics any more praise than that because that was what they they their plan was. Drew Holiday tried to give them a performance. He didn't have it. Grayson Allen put up another zero point game. Oh, he had a free throw. I'm sorry. Another zero from three game. Wesley Matthews, zero from three. Pat Connaughton, zero from three. And one thing I thought that was interesting is that they had Drew Holiday guard and Jason Tatum earlier in this game. And throughout the majority of the series, it was a lot of Wesley Matthews. So he's like, you know what? We're going to put Drew on him because Drew is our all defensive player. Um, and, we, and we believe in him. And Jason Tatum just is one of the greatest tough shot makers in the entire game of basketball. Like out of his five threes, I think that four of them were just like heavily contested threes that went in. Like that's what he was doing today. But I was more impressed with his playmaker throughout the game. Yeah, he ended with seven turnovers, but I looked past that because he got so many open looks for other people just by putting the ball in the basket and getting to the rim. Like I said, they pack the paint. Once you get your foot into that restricted area, you got five bucks looking at you and you can kick it out to Grant Williams or kick it out to Peyton Pritchard, who I feel like most of his shots were off the dribble, step to the side threes, like he'd been training with Jason Tatum. So hell of hell of a series from them um, to win this one. I think my initial pick was them in six, uh, but the Bucks gave them one extra game, which is dope. I think that the better, more complete team won tonight um, and won the series. If Chris Middleton is there, maybe it's a different story, but he wasn't there. So I got to get my flowers to the Boston Celtics. And like I said, we will talk about their series um, in a day or two, once I rack my brain about these matchups between the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat, because I'm assuming that some of these games are going to end up 97 to 93, and that's just what we're going to have to do. That's what we're going to have to deal with, y'all. One thing I did not, well, I cannot wait for, um, is the post game interviews from these guys. I, I wonder what's going to be said by Chris Paul and Devin Booker, because I love them, I, like I truly do, but a lot of their post game interviews come off not the greatest. Um, and, and I think it's a, a, a cliche saying, but there's a fine line between confidence and cocky. And I think a lot of their um, their postgame interviews lie exactly on that line where like some people might see it as, well, yeah, Chris Paul is one of the greatest of all time and Devin Booker's an NBA player. So, yeah, they believe in themselves. But I think there's some, some people that can look at it and be like them, them, them dudes right there are cocky, cocky, cocky. 
Um, and I can't imagine what the Suns fans are going through. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, Marquise Chris just hit a three. I'm into my video. 